Hello everyone in Cardio Minds channel and today we are starting a new topic in the guidelines which are the cardiovascular disease prevention of 2021. Based on the demands of some of you who watch these videos and they are not from Arabic countries so they don't understand Arabic and they asked me to release the videos in English language, I will start to release the videos on Cardio Minds in English language so it can reach any doctor worldwide and anyone can understand them. Today we are going to start with a preamble to the guidelines of cardiovascular disease prevention in order to understand the frame of these guidelines and so we can understand what we are going to do in the next videos. Needless to say of course about the burden of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease which is still a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Although its incidence is dropping in some of the European countries, it is still having high incidence worldwide especially in the middle. East. And if we are looking for the causes of this high incidence, the high prevalence of course of unhealthy lifestyle including the unhealthy diet and the lack of exercise in many of the populations and also the poorly treated risk factors even sometimes in patients at high risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. That's why it is still causing high morbidity and mortality. And if we are looking about the accurate definition of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, it includes clinical disease like for example previous MI or acute coronary syndrome, history of stroke or TIA, presence of aortic aneurysm, peripheral arterial disease or any history of arterial revascularization like coronary, peripheral or carotids. And also presence of unequivocal disease on imaging like presence of plaques in coronary angiography, in CT coronaries or carotids ultrasound. So the term atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease doesn't include only coronary artery disease, it includes all the atherosclerosis in any vascular beds. The guidelines this year focus on three main aspects which are risk factors and modifiers, risk classification or sometimes we call it risk stratification and of course the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease prevention. The aim of this process is to reduce the risk of developing cardiovascular disease in the general population and that's why we are discussing these guidelines in these videos and also identifying the patients who will benefit most from risk factor treatment because if you identify the high risk and the very high risk patients at this time they will get the maximal benefit because if we try to understand this we can learn that the higher the absolute cardiovascular disease risk the higher the absolute benefit of risk factor treatment and then the lower the number needed to treat to prevent one cardiovascular disease event during a period of time so of course at the personal level there is a great benefit and also at the population level that's why the estimation of the cardiovascular disease risk is a cornerstone which we are going to repeat many times in our management schemes in these guidelines Let's speak about one of the famous terminologies which was extensively used in the last guidelines of cardiovascular prevention in 2016 which is the 10 year cardiovascular death or risk of fatal cardiovascular disease. Of course the choice of mortality rather than the total event including fatal and non-fatal was deliberate till 2016 guidelines but not universally popular and it was rejected by many physicians because it omits the non-fatal events. The problem is that the non-fatal events were critically dependent upon definition and the methods used in their assertment. That's why when they were estimating the risk, they only included the risk of cardiovascular death or risk of fatal cardiovascular events like fatal MI or fatal strokes. However, the cardiovascular morbidity including fatal and non-fatal events combined with the cardiovascular disease mortality is more accurate to reflect the total burden of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease because I am not speaking only about the risk in this patient to develop fatal MI or fatal stroke but I want also to include the risk of non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke for example. That's why a multiplier approach was used to convert the cardiovascular mortality rates to include fatal and non-fatal events. So we now have another term called 10 year total cardiovascular risk which include both events and it has another score instead of the old one which is a score 2 and a score 2 OB. SCORE is an acronym standing for systematic 
coronary risk estimation. And the number two, because this is a new version different from the 2016 guidelines. Score two is used for apparently healthy individuals between 40 and 69 year old. And the score two OB is standing for older persons who are 70 year or older. But remember that the 10 year total cardiovascular risk doesn't apply to patients with documented cardiovascular disease, diabetes, familiar hyperlipidemia, CKD, or pregnant women. They will have a different way for risk stratification. There is another terminology that sometimes is used as a surrogate to the 10 year risk, which is lifetime cardiovascular disease risk. It is available for younger, apparently healthy individuals to support treatment decision in some patients. Why? Because sometimes the 10 year risk may underestimate the risk of cardiovascular events, especially if as this patient is having high risk factor for a specific one, but the other factors are absent. So the 10 year risk may be underestimated. Although the patient has a significantly high lifetime cardiovascular risk, that's why it can be used as a surrogate to the 10 year risk in younger individuals, like for example, patient younger than 50 year old. The residual cardiovascular disease risk is defined as the risk estimated after initial lifestyle change and risk factor treatment. And so it is used mostly in patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease because you can estimate what is the remaining risk after the lifestyle modification and risk factor control. But we are not using the term residual cardiovascular risk in patients who are apparently healthy. So we can conclude that risk stratification is performed in three groups who are the apparently healthy people, established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, strong risk factor like diabetes, familiar hyperlipidemia, and CKD. In this map here, we can see the four clusters of countries based on the National Cardiovascular Disease Mortality Rate published by the WHO, which are classified into low risk countries, moderate risk countries, high risk countries and very high risk countries, which are very important before we select the score two algorithm because the algorithm is different in each cluster of them. And we can see here that most of the Middle Eastern countries are in the very high risk countries. The guidelines this year is trying to adopt a stepwise approach in dealing with the individuals in the process of prevention and risk stratification. It should start at first with the prevention goals for all, including the apparently healthy people, patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and patients with a specific risk condition. We should take into consideration the risk modifiers like psychosocial stress, ethnicities, imaging and comorbidities as well. Then we are going to perform risk estimation in order that I will classify this person into being low, moderate, high or very high risk patients. Then I will have an informed discussion with this patient regarding his cardiovascular disease risk in the 10 year or sometimes a lifetime risk, the treatment benefits, and this should be tailored to his individual needs and the preference. And then this would result in personalized treatment decision. At the individual level, intervention and treatment goals, it can be in the form of lifestyle changes, treatment of risk factors, antithrombotic therapies in some patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and also population level intervention like the public health policy and advocacy. This all results finally in the reduction of cardiovascular disease burden. And finally, the guidelines remind us to stop these harmful measures like the therapeutic nihilism, which considers the medication to be more harmful rather than being beneficial. So we don't need any medication for any patient. This is, of course, is completely wrong because some patients, especially those with established acerocardiovascular cardiovascular disease or with strong risk factors, would need to take medication for optimal risk factor control. Also, the common mistake of omitting the treatment assessment after the first step, which is a common mistake. It includes assessment of the therapeutic effect and assessment of side effects of the medication. Ignoring patient participation, because in this case, the patient may neglect follow up or stop the treatment because he was not shared in the decision making process. And so he is not convinced. And so we didn't have any risk factor control for him. Thank you very much for watching this short preamble and in the next video we are going in depth of the guidelines of cardiovascular prevention. So wait for this interesting experience.